When you see these letters from our eager hand, could your eye recognize the sender, or did you fail to recognize their author until you could read my name? Sappho. Since I am famous for the lyric, do you wonder why my lines vary in length? But I weep, and tears fit well the elegy. A lyre cannot bear the weight of tears. I am on fire and wasted like a burning field with its grain turning to ashes in the east wind's blast. The fields where you are now, on the slopes of Typhoeus Etna, Phaon, are far away, but no less subject than I to the flames that come by storm. I do not make songs now for a well-tuned string, for songs are the work of carefree minds. No Prian girls please me now, nor do those from Methymna, nor any from Lesbos. Anactoria is nothing to me now, nor is that dazzling beauty Sidro. Atthis no longer brings joy to my eyes as she did once. Nor do I find pleasure in the hundred others I have loved in shame. Yours is now the love these maids once had, your face, the beauty that astonished my eyes. Your years are ready for life's pleasures. Take up the lyre and a quiver of arrows, you will seem to us like Apollo, or let horns burst from your brow and be Bacchus. Phoebus loved Daphne, and Bacchus loved the maiden from Knossos, but neither of them knew the lyric mode. Still, the daughters of Pegasus come to me with sweetest songs. My name is known all over the earth. Alcaeus himself has no richer fame, he who shares not only my gift for song but also my homeland, though he sings a song of more dignity than my lyrics. If nature denies me the gift of beauty, let my name's measure be my stature. If this my beauty does not dazzle your eyes, then recall that dark Andromeda was beautiful to Perseus, though she was dark with the hue of her native land. What is more, white pigeons often mate with birds of a darker color, and the black turtle dove is loved by birds of green plumage. If no woman can be yours unless her beauty is thought to be great enough, then there is no woman who will be yours. But my beauty seemed sufficient when you heard me read my songs. You insisted then that those words made me forever beautiful. I would sing, I remember, for all lovers remember all. And while I sang, you were busy stealing kisses from me. You even praised my kisses. I must have pleased you in all things, but especially when we toiled at the task of love. Then, I recall, my playful abandon delighted you more than you had known before. A quick joke, a sudden embrace to spice our game, and when our joys were at last one joy, the deep weariness that filled our spent bodies. But you seek new quarry, Sicilian maids. What does Lesbos mean to me? I wish I were a girl in Sicily. Send him back to me, you Nisian mothers and Nisian daughters. Do not be tricked by the lies that fall so easily from his charming tongue. What he says to you, he said to me. You. Ericina, who roams the mountains of Sicania, I am yours, lady. You must protect your singer. Must my sad fortune go on as it began, always bitter in its swift passage? Only six birthdays had come and gone for me when I swept up my father's bones, dead too soon, and let them drink my young tears. Caught up with the whore, untrained in loving ways, my innocent brother bore the foulest shame and suffered the greatest loss. Beggared, he roams the blue oceans with a quick oar, while the riches he wasted in evil pleasure he seeks now to win by evil means. 
because I scolded him often and faithfully, I have now only his hatred. Truthfulness and duty brought me this. And though I have much to give me endless care, a young daughter completes my worry. But the last thing of which I complain is you. My boat is not propelled by friendly breezes. Look, my hair tangles about my neck, my hands display no glittering gems. I wear a rough shift. No gold is sprinkled in my hair, my curls have no foreign sense. For whose pleasure should I dress, and for whom should I adorn my body? You are gone, you, the only right cause for my adornment. My tender heart is easily hurt by the slight shaft. I always have good reason to be in love, but then what happened? Can it be that when I was born the sisters set this as a law for my nature, but did not spin out for me a living thread tough enough to bear this fateful weight? Or is it that desire becomes character and my mistress, Thalia, softens me? Can it be any wonder that I am swept away at the sight of your manhood as it shows itself at the start of those years when men's love reveals its first stirring? It seems now that I must be afraid that you, Aurora, would steal him away and put him in the place of a cephalus, and so you would, but your first choice holds your eye. Phoebe should see him, she who sees all things, and it will be Phaon that she preserves in sleep. Venus might well have taken him off to the skies in her ivory chariot, but she knows all too well that he might have caught the eye of her Mars himself. Neither just a man nor still a boy, age joins with charm. Splendor and great glory of your age, come here to me, sail back, O oh beautiful man, to the warmth and strength of my embrace. My plea is not that you should love, but rather that you let yourself be loved by me. As I write, my eyes let the welling tears flow like dewdrops. Only observe the blots that blur the lines I have written. If you wished so strongly to leave, you could have gone away from me with greater dignity. At the very least, you might have said, Farewell, woman of Lesbos. You did not take my tears. You took no kisses of mine. I felt no fear for the pain I would suffer. You left nothing, nothing but my hurt, and you took nothing, nothing to bring to mind your abandoned lover. I gave you no commands, though I would have given you none but the hope you would remember me. By our love, may it never be far away. By the holy nine, my goddesses, I swear that when I heard your joy is fleeing away, I could neither weep nor speak. Eyes could not form tears and tongue could not form words. My heart was frozen with a cold frost. When I recovered grief, I beat my breast and tore my hair, and without shame I shrieked like the loving mother who lifts to the high funeral pyre her son's empty body. The heart of my brother, Charaxus, rushes with joy at my misery. He comes before my eyes and fades from my sight, hoping to make my woe improper. He says, her daughter is still alive. She need not grieve. Love and decency are not the same. No one could avoid seeing me. Still, I tore open my robes and exposed my breast. It is you, Phaon, who are my concern. You it is that comes to me in my dreams, dreams that come brighter than the beauty of day. There, in my dreams, I find you, though you are far away. The joys of sleep are too short. So often, it seems, I press the weight of my neck against your arms, and so often do I place my arms beneath your neck. I know the kisses, the tongue's caresses, which once you enjoyed giving and getting. 
It seems I fondle you while uttering words that are near the truth of wakefulness and my sensation is guarded by my lips. I blush to say more. All comes to pass. Throughout every part of my body a great pleasure rushes and I discover that now I can no longer control myself. I am no longer joyless and dry. Then, when Titan appears and lights the earth, I am sad that sleep has left me so soon. I go to the woods and the rocky hollows, if only such places could help me. There I run in a frenzy as though maddened by the touch of Ennio. My hair loose in the wind, it flies about my neck. I see the coarse rocks that hang above the paths, places that once were like Mygdonian marble. I find the forest, which so often was a bower in which we lay, shading us with heavy leaves. But I do not find him who was lord of both that forest and me. Now it is cheap and has no value. He was the gift that enriched that remote place. I see the crushed grasses and the turf, the sod that took on the impress of our weight. I have reclined and touched the place where you rested. The grass that once was welcoming to me has been watered with my tears. Even the branches have given up their leaves and no birds are singing their sweet songs. Only the bird of Dallas, that grief-stricken mother who brought an awful revenge to her lord, cries for Itis of Ismarus. The pitiable bird sings of Itis while Sappho sings her song of love abandoned. There is no more but nighttime silence. I found the sacred spring of water more pure than the finest crystal. Many think a spirit dwells in its depths. Above it spreads a water lotus, itself a grove. Here the grass grows greener and tender. I laid down my tired body and let the tears flow, when suddenly before me stood a naiad. Standing there, she said, Because you burn with flames that are unsatisfied, you must find the land that is called Ambracia. In that place, Phoebus surveys from the heavens the great stretch of sea that touches both Actium and Leucadia. In this place, Diocalion, consumed with love for Pyrrha, threw himself down, striking the sea without harming his body. The man's passion left the heart that was beneath the waves, and Diocalion was free of love's pain. This is the law of that distant place. Go now. Search out the high cliff of Leucadia and do not let yourself be afraid to leap. The advice was given. Her words stopped and she vanished from my sight. I rose, frightened, and the tears would not stop their flowing. Nymph, I am off to seek the cliff you described. Fear be gone, my passion evicts it. Whatever shall come to pass will be better by far than my present misery. You breezes, hurry to me, raise up my flesh. It is not a thing of much substance. Sweet love, bear me up on your wings, lest my death be the fault of Leucadia's waves. Then I will dedicate to Phoebus the shell that has always been our common good. Beneath it let there be engraved in the stone one verse followed by another verse. Phoebus, the grateful poetess, Sappho, brings a lyre, a gift proper to us both. But why is it that you force me to Actium's coast, despondent as I am when you could so easily turn your steps back to me? You would be better by far for me than Leucadia's surf. You can be Phoebus to me in beauty and in kindness. But if I die, you who are more dangerous than cliffs or waves, can you bear the shame? 
Better it would be to press my breast to yours than to fling it from the rocky cliff. This, Phaon, is the woman's bosom you praise, the woman who seemed to have genius. I wish that eloquence were mine now, but grief kills my art and woe stops my genius. The gift of song I enjoyed will not answer my call. Lear and Plectrum are silent, daughters of Lesbos who will marry or who are married, daughters of Lesbos whose names one time were sung to my Aeolian Lear, daughters of Lesbos whom I loved and for whose love I am ashamed. Stop there. Do not come to hear my shell's music. Phaon has destroyed what you once held so dear. Poor me. I nearly said my Phaon. Bring him back. You will find your singer restored. He was my genius. It left with him. Are my prayers good for nothing? Has his low-born heart been moved, or does it remain cold and unfeeling while Zephyr carries away these words that fall with such idleness? I wish that the breezes which scatter my words would bring your sails back to this island. If your heart had any care, then such a deed would be proper for one so delayed. If it remains your plan to return to me, but you are still delayed by the need to fashion a gift to mount to the ship's stern. Why do you destroy me with delay? Leave your anchorage. Venus was born out of the sea and opens passages for the lover. The winds will hurry you along if you but leave your mooring. Cupid will be your pilot. He sits in the stern with his delicate hands. He himself will open, then fold the sails. But if you wish to flee from Sappho of Pelasgos, though you can find no reason for such a flight, at least you must permit a letter. Cruel though it must surely be to tell me this woe, and I will find my fate in Lucadia's waves. <laughs>